So I've just completed 53 hours on the Nebula around Wolf Star 134 and the appearance of the Nebula kind of got me thinking. So I've imaged a few nebula uh, around Wolf Ray at stars with both the Skywatcher and the Mead and there was something about the appearance of a lot of these nebula that kind of looked very similar although there were some that looked different and it got me thinking is there a reason why a lot of these nebula look very similar? Now the 53 hours I just completed was with the Stellar Mirror um, 90mm refractor over in Spain not at home because it's a Northern Hemisphere target. So for those of you who have seen a previous video of mine, I have the use of a Stellar Mirror 90mm refractor in Spain. It's f6, 540mm focal length. And on the back there is an ASI 2600mm Pro camera, uh, which I'm using to do all my imaging when I'm in, uh, using the rig in Spain. And uh, in the filter wheel there are 36mm Antlia LRGB filters and 3nm SHO filters. Now about 11 months ago I did a video on a bubble that I imaged around Wolf Rate Star 16 or WR16 and I called it the Southern Raspberry Nebula and uh, I also showed a picture of another nebula, the RCW58 um, and there was something about these um, nebula that started to get me thinking about why they look very similar and I'll tell you what I mean. Now as a first example, if we look at the Crescent Nebula, which I think most people are familiar with, uh, this nebula here surrounds a wolf rate star called WR136. Now this is an image that I took from Spain uh, with a Stellar Mirror uh, triplet refractor as well. And if you look in here, although there is a sort of more smooth, although a little bit sort of bubbly here, um, O3 shell, if you look at the HA, it's kind of very wrinkled and a little bit clumpy and um, it's it's not particularly round but uh, the, the nebula seems to have, particularly the HA stuff, seems to have quite an irregular sort of lumpy look to it. So if we then look at another example, and this is an image I took down here in the southern hemisphere uh, of the Wolf Rayet Star WR16 and this sort of bubble type nebula around it, you'll notice that somewhat similar appearance, it's got this sort of irregular, slightly clumpy, knotty look to it. Now this nebula doesn't have a name, I sort of gave it the name the Southern Raspberry Nebula just because I thought it deserved something other than just the bubble around WR16. But although this one example is much more round, there are some similar appearances with the look of the HA component at least of the Crescent Nebula. So for a third example, uh, if we look at RCW58, an image I took here at home with the Mead telescope, uh, this nebula surrounds Wolf Rate Star WR40. Now this nebula does share a bit more of a resemblance with the Crescent Nebula. It is, it's not particularly round, it is a little bit sort of oval looking and it does have an outer O3 shell but the HA component again has this very sort of knotty or clumpy look to it. But not all Wolf Rat Star Nebula have this sort of clumpy look to it. Some of them do have the appearance much more of a typical smooth bubble and an example of this is the Dolphin Head Nebula and this is an image I did a collaboration with Olive and uh, the Wolf Rat Star that this nebula surrounds is WR6, also known as EZ Canis Majoris. And so for the last example we come to the image that I've done most recently using the rig in Spain of the nebula surrounding WR134, Wolf Star 134. Now the nebula itself doesn't have a name, it's just referred to by the Wolf Rayet Star in the center, although I did have somebody suggest that it looks a bit like the looking down on a gas stove top, which I do agree it does look a bit like that. Now some of the nebula here has a very smooth appearance like you see in the Dolphin Head Nebula, but a lot of it has this very clumped or knotty look 
very similar to um, RCW58 and also to the Southern Raspberry Nebula or the, or the nebula surrounding WR16. And when I saw this, this got me thinking, why do these have this very sort of knotty, sort of clumpy look? Now, most of the nebula comes up in O3. There is a little bit of this area here and here in HA, and there's nothing in S2. But the O3 is a much stronger signal than the HA. Having said that, it is still fairly faint, the O3. And I was doing 10 minute exposures and I, it took me 31 hours of ex total exposure time to get this amount of detail on the O3. The hardest area is down here where it sort of mixes in with the background HA. I did about 11 hours of HA, which as I said, primarily picks up some of the background here and also about nine hours of S2. And in the S2, an interesting feature was, it's sort of showing up here because I've com kind of combined the HA and the S2 to give more of an HOO look to this image, but most prominent in the S2 was a thing that looked a bit like a bow shock over here. Also, there was this uh, area of HA, which kind of looked interesting, reminded me a little bit of a bull with horns uh, or a, a wildebeest. And down here were some interesting little fine um, O3 filaments mixed in a bit with some HA filaments as well. Looking into Pixlin's site at the stacks of the three filters, here we have the O3 and if we just zoom in, you can see this is the bright area around here. And these areas are quite faint in here, so that did require a bit of processing to try and bring that out. Plus the fact there's a lot of stars in this area and there is some background nebulosity. If I bring up the HA, it's obviously um, picking up mostly all the background stuff, but again, zooming in, you can see there's some of the smoother areas of this nebula, and there is a little bit of the sort of clumpy, knotty bit here, but again, much less than the O3. If we have a look at the S2, um, we're not really seeing any of the features of the nebula surrounding WR134, uh, but it was interesting to see that there was this um, interesting, let's zoom in here, sort of bow shock type structure, most prominent actually in the S2 and a little bit in the HA and not seen in the O3 at all. Now if we remove the stars, we can start to see the nebulosity a lot better. Now in the S2, you can see there's not really any evidence of the nebula surrounding WR134, although it does a bit more highlight this area that I mentioned where there does look like there's a bit of a kind of a shockwave structure here. Uh, looking at the HA, uh, we can see again a lot of the background nebulosity. Um, you can see a little bit of this sort of shockwave look but you can see some of the structure of the nebula surrounding WR134, some of the smooth component and some of the knotty component, but it kind of starts to fade away as we get over to here. Once we remove the stars and everything from the O3 version, now you can get a better appreciation for the whole of the nebula surrounding uh, the Wolf Rayet star. And uh, now we can see these areas down here as well. And you can get a better appreciation now, I think, for the very knotty look and how similar this looks to some of those other Wolf Rayet star nebulae. Um, but again, you know, there's a very smooth component over here, similar to the dolphin head. Where do these Wolf Rayet stars come from and how common are they? Well, they're actually pretty rare. There's not a lot of them around, but they are actually very important in the production of a lot of the heavier elements. Now, if we have a look at um, stars and where they are in relation to the main sequence of which our sun is a main sequence star, we can see it's down here. The Wolf Rayet stars come from O-type stars, which are these stars up here, and they are a heck of a lot bigger than our sun. Uh, don't know exactly how accurate this uh, representation is, but in a direct proportion, but here's the sun over here, quite small. Here's a Wolf Rayet star, and here's an O star. Now, the Wolf Rayet star appears to be a bit smaller than the O3 star because it actually shed a lot of its outer layers, the hydrogen, and I'll talk about that in a minute. So, how massive are these stars? Well, a Wolf Rayet star is between 30 and 200 solar masses, so quite a lot larger. Now, these Wolf Rayet stars are also very hot stars. So, our sun's surface temperature is about 6,000 Kelvin whereas a Wolf Rayet star is around 30 to 150,000 
Kelvin. So they're greater than 30 times hotter than our sun's surface, so really, really hot stars. They're also very luminous stars, um, so about 150,000 to about 5 million times more luminous than our sun. But they don't necessarily appear very bright optically because most of that uh, sort of luminosity is in the UV spectrum which we can't see. Now I said these wolf rat stars you know come from these large type O stars and the reason being is that uh, when a star goes into the wolf rat star phase it actually sheds uh, most of its hydrogen which I think is being depicted here which is why it looks a little bit smaller than the O type star. So if we look at this uh, very crude diagram I've done to show how a wolf rat star forms from a type O star so the type O star would have an outer layer of uh, hydrogen and then inside there'd be further helium and nitrogen being formed in carbon and oxygen. And what the star does um, as it's going into become the wolf ray star, it ejects the hydrogen uh, through the strong stellar winds. And once a star becomes a wolf ray star, it has very, very strong stellar winds. And when you eject that um, hydrogen, you're then left with helium and predominantly helium and nitrogen. Uh, in uh, sort of early on and that's called a WN star and you can further qualify these WN star the N sort of standing for the nitrogen really uh, as early or late so you can have a WNE star or a WNL star early or late star and then when they eject sort of the helium and the nitrogen layer you're left with uh, a wolf rat star with predominantly carbon and, and some oxygen and that's called a WC star Again, you can add an E and an L, whether it's early or late, WCE for early, WCL for late. And there is a rarer type of uh, wolf rat star where oxygen uh, predominant, predominates over the carbon, and that's called a WO star. So, of course, now I wanted to know why do a lot of these wolf rat nebulae look similar with this knotty, sort of clumped appearance, whilst others look like sort of smooth bubbles. So I went ahead and did a bit of searching. During my search, I was quite pleased to come across this paper from 2015 in Astronomy and Astrophysics, where uh, a group had actually looked at, uh, they'd done a morphological study of wolf rat star nebulae. So effectively looking at the sort of shape and the appearance of the nebulae that surround these wolf rat stars. And they also clearly obviously had seen that there was a variation in the appearances of some of these and wanted to know why? Uh, did it have any bearing on the type of wolf rat star or in the medium that is surrounding, etc.? So this uh, paper went a long way to answering the question that I had as well. So they divided the nebulae surrounding wolf rat stars into three different groups. The first group was the B group or the true bubble, so a nice smooth um, outer you know sort of shell if you like and WR6 they've given them as an example which is the, dol the one the dolphin head nebula then there was the C type the clumpy or disrupted um, bubbles and again they've given an the example of w WR40 um, the crescent nebula would also I think be an example of that as well and then there was the M type or mixed wolf rat nebulae which were so sort of didn't have a defined morphology were a bit more irregular now how these, uh, they sort of felt that a lot of the nebula went through a stage of starting off as a bubble. So the wolf rat star when it forms, so the O star blows off the hydrogen, you get this sort of outer rim of hydrogen and then the solar winds from the wolf rat star form a nice smooth bubble. Then later on as it's starting to sort of eject more material and the winds are getting stronger, you're then starting to disrupt that bubble and you get a more clumpy appearance. And finally, with the very, very strong winds of the um, WR stars, uh, you now start to get that uh, nebula mixing with the interstellar medium and that's why they get this more ill-defined sort of look to them. And so it was thought that these wolf rat stars and their nebulae tend to progress through the phases. So they'll start off as a bubble and then they'll become more a clumpy type nebula and then finally they'll become a more diffuse type. And what they also wanted to see was if we're looking at a particular type of wolf rat star, whether it be a sort of a carbon dominant one or a nitrogen dominant one, are we more likely to see a type of morphology associated with that star? 
and it kind of turned out to be sort of loosely associated. So if we looked at a nitrogen wolf, predominant wolf rate star in the early phase, we tended to see more smooth bubbles surrounding them. If we looked at a late phase nitrogen one, they tended to have a more clumpy lock and that's probably related to the fact that it's ejected more material and there's stronger winds and so you're now starting to disrupt the bubble. And if we looked at the carbon predominant ones, they tended to be more associated with the um, ill-defined or M-type nebulae. Researching all this has certainly gone a long way to answering them. the question that was in the back of my head, why are these wolf rat nebula looking all very similar? Well, most of them with that sort of clumpy, knotty look. And um, I think that WR134, my latest image, uh, certainly would predominantly form, fall into that sort of clumpy category, the C category. Um, Admittedly, there's a little bit of the sort of smooth bits on the edges there, but I think predominantly it would be a C type. So look, I hope you found the video interesting. Um, certainly researching about the nebulae surrounding wolf rat stars I found quite fascinating. And they are quite cool objects to image. They've got quite a lot of nice, interesting structure to them. Uh, imaging WR134 was uh, quite a challenge because it is a very faint target and that's why I needed that 30 hours of O3 to try and bring out the features in the, in the well, I suppose you call it a bubble, but in the nebula we should call it. Um, so yeah, if you enjoyed this video uh, and found it interesting or you learned something, um, consider giving it a thumbs up. And um, look, if you haven't subscribed to the channel, consider doing so. There's lots of other videos that I've done and I've got more uh, coming. And uh, until uh, the next time I've imaged a target, in fact I do, I've got a nice really interesting planetary nebula that I'll do in the next video, um, I'll wish everybody lots and lots of clear skies.